Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. It's February, brand new month, which means we have a brand new sale and a new giveaway because it's a new episode. So let's talk about the sale first, then I'm going to tell you what we're going to give away for free. So here's the sale, right? So we have two very popular MAPS programs, and they're seemingly very different, although they work very well together. The first one is MAPS Performance. This is a program designed to help you train and look like an athlete. So you, you look good, but you also can move well, right? Laterally, you can rotate, you're explosive and functional. A lot of people like to work out this way. That's what MAPS Performance is all about. And then we also have MAPS Aesthetic. This is a bodybuilder style program. That program's more about balance and symmetry and aesthetic. So they're both 50% off right now. That's the sale. So if you want MAPS Performance, you go to mapsgreen.com. If you want MAPS Aesthetic, you go to mapsblack.com. And then the code for 50% off is FEB50 for both of them. Now here's the giveaway. MAPS Aesthetic in mass performance. So one of you will get both for free right now. All you got to do is this, right? Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all three things. If we like your comment and we think it's the best comment among all the comments, we'll notify you and you'll get both programs for free. And by the way, you run them together, incredible results. You get the functional fitness of MAPS performance and the aesthetics of MAPS aesthetics. A really, really great combination. So there you go. Another great uh, giveaway, great sale, and here comes a great podcast. Here you go. Do you want to look bigger? Sometimes you have to get smaller to look bigger. Is that what you uh, tell the ladies, yeah. Justin? <laughs> what? Is that what you tell the ladies? No, you know what? This is We got to talk about this because uh, I know as a kid, I was obviously I was skinny, always trying to bulk all the time, trying to get big. And the first time I actually got really lean, because I didn't get lean, lean, lean for a long time, because I just I didn't want to lose any weight on the scales. I like, super insecure about that, right? So I think I was in my 20s, and it was the first time I got below 10% body fat. And of course, my weight on the scale was lighter because I'm leaner. And it was the first time, one of the first times people actually approached me in the gym was like, oh my gosh, you look so huge. You're huge. And then I realized it's because I'm leaner and I have more definition that I look a lot bigger. And uh, it's funny, right? So to look bigger. You'd never think that. I mean, I would never think that. Yeah. And all I, my entire goal was just always just get big, get big. It, to tell me that like to, to cut down, it, it was not going to happen. Yeah. I know you had a similar experience. Uh, exact same. The, the funny part about it is how driven we are by our insecurity to look this certain way. Totally. In, in search of, uh, you know, our peers telling us, how great we look or how buff or how big we look. And then the the first time that you decide to go in this cut of shrinking down, getting leaner, getting smaller, you get the most, uh, oh my God, you look big compliments yes. than I had in my entire life. So that was the irony in it was I spent at least uh, a, a decade of bulking consistently and never cutting to finally go on like, okay, well, let's see what happens when I lean out. And then all the, you get, and my, by, by the way too, I, I vividly remember um, when I was going through that phase, even though I was getting those compliments inside my head, I still felt smaller and I still had a, I struggled with the insecurity of not filling my shirts out, right? As you lean out, I start mm. to look like a coat hanger in my XL shirts. Sure. And so I remember that messing with my head going like, oh my God, I'm getting smaller, I'm getting smaller. But then, then people were telling me, oh my God, you look so I big. literally, I literally had people come up to me in the gym. This is what blew me away is they would come up to me and say, man, you put on some serious size. Yeah. How much muscle yeah. have you gained? I'm like, I've gained nothing. Yeah. I'm actually 10 pounds lighter uh, than I was before. Uh, like a 16-inch a, a arm on somebody who's lean, single-digit body fat, is way more impressive in real life than an 18-inch arm on a dude that's body fat is, you know, in the high teens. Yeah. This is just a fact. So, And by the way, this, this goes both ways. A lot of people who are constantly worried about, oh my gosh, I, I can't gain a single pound. When they gain a little bit of muscle, all of a sudden they look leaner. How many times have you had that, oh, yeah, right, yeah. with a female client where yeah, they sure. gain a little muscle and they're like, my husband says I look leaner, but I'm actually three pounds heavier. Yeah. So these the are all scale. like optical illusions, basically. It is. And I think the moral of the story is your, your insecurities, which we all kind of have. We all have a little bit, right? Your insecurities create a filter. And you you don't have like an objective view of yourself. Yeah. It's, it, well, it's always subjective, but it's really tilted in one direction. So you'll look in the mirror and be like, oh my God, I look terrible. And then wonder why people are coming up to you saying, you look healthy or you look fit. Like what's going on? I feel like part of the yeah. size one too has to do, I mean, or at least I remember being a, a teenage boy and like that's, you measured your bicep. 
Like that was the thing, yeah, right? right? Like if you're all, we all started working out, everybody was starting in the gym. It's like the the measure of the success of your training was how big is your bicep? And that was like, that was it. There was no, any other measurements we were paying attention to. It was like, has your, has your bicep grown a half an inch to an inch over the last year or two that you've been lifting? And that's how we all decided whether you were successful or not, or looking good, right? Yeah, Which, it's funny because yeah. uh, my, I, I introduced uh, the movie Fight Club to my son, couple years ago quickly became one of his favorite movies so like he likes to show his oh, friends nice. right and they're watching it and he actually had some friends over they're watching the movie and uh one of his friends comments like man uh uh what's what's his name brad pitt was buffed in fight club dude he was so jack he was like 150 he pounds was, in that yeah he was really lean he was just really lean yes yeah, so just shredded to the to the gills yeah, yeah and it's it, you know that definition really create and now what's the moral of this right if again your filter really distorts things a lot of times. So if you're on this like permanent bulk all the time because you're always trying to look yeah. bigger, get lean and see what happens. And again, the reverse is true also for people who are always so afraid to gain. And it's more, usually more tr true for women, but there's guys that do this as well. They're so afraid of gaining any body fat that they're always restricting their calories. And really, when, when they gain a little bit of muscle is when they really get the look that they're looking for. Well, this for. doesn't support your case at all, but like, because I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get like these high school kids out of that mindset of like always trying to be ripped and oh, lean. Oh, well, that's and, different. You know, dude, but this is such a thing that wasn't a thing back in the day. Like, we just wanted to get big and, and, and jacked. And, and it, that's really not something that's very commonly found anymore. Like, because they always want to like show off the muscles and like do the beach muscle thing. And nobody's really into like stacking plates. Oh, as as totally high different. schoolers, huh? Yeah. It's, See, I don't it's do, not a thing. It wasn't like that when I was a kid. Not it, That didn't happen until like 20s. You know, I think they're more aware now because of social media, maybe. Yeah, I think that's definitely yeah. going to Now, the difference with that, obviously, is in football, uh, your mass plays a big role in yes. your momentum. Right? Exactly. So that's why I'm motivated. I'm like, I, I need you to eat more calories, please. <laughs> you know, and uh, that way, like, we're just going to have a more effective um, you know, body to deal with all of that trauma and, and, you know, stress that we're going to place, you know, in these games. And so, yeah, you need to have like a resilient, strong body. I don't really care if you have abs. No, there's a weight to strength ratio that's important too, but it's no, there's no weight class. It's not like wrestling where, you know, if you pack on a bunch of weight, now you're just wrestling a bigger dude, like on the field, you know, and you're hitting somebody, if you have 10 more pounds on your body and you've got a good strength to weight ratio, right? So it's not making you super sluggish or slow. Yeah. And let's say you, you stay just as fast, but you gain 10 pounds. You hit someone with that same speed, it's going to hit much harder yep. because you're much bigger. So that's totally different uh, than what I said, you know, at the beginning of, <laughs> of it. But yeah. that's a good point though. Derailed. No, yeah. no, no. That's a very, very good point. Uh, when you play sports, you want to consider that kind of stuff. And in the weight class sports, uh, people need to consider that as well. Like I know guys, I knew guys that would take uh, performance enhancing drugs to gain muscle and strength. To and but they competed in weight class events. So and the problem with that is you you're taking gear to move up a weight class. Now you're bigger and stronger, but now you're going against guys that are naturally yeah at that heavy. Comfortable and at that weight. Comfortable well, at that weight, naturally na at that weight, you're going to get your butt kicked by yep. them. Yeah, and they naturally have a bone structure totally. and ligaments and tendons that support that size where you've artificially inflated your muscles to get that size, which you've just got that part. You're missing the the, the, the skeletal structure of that 240-pound guy or whatever oh, that dude, a juiced fit, up to get a to. Fit, a fit and strong, geared up 240-pound guy versus a fit and strong natural 240 Totally different. Well, do you know what you, you and if you know if you pay attention to what these guys walk around uh, like off season, yeah, the ones that are normally the most dominant. There's always exceptions to the rule that are like great fighters with that, but the guys that are normally dominant in their weight class walk around naturally like 30, 40 pounds. Yeah, they cut way down heavier, and they had to cut really, really hard to get down that. So a guy who walks around, let's say the weight class around two ten, walks around two fifty, cuts down to get into two ten weight class versus a guy who is a, a one eighty guy juiced out of his gills to get up to two ten. I'll bet on the guy that walks around at 250 Yeah, if all, all things day. are equal. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Obviously, fight skills make a, a big difference in that, yeah. but for the most part, that guy has a huge advantage. Yeah, but you know, when it comes to aesthetics, right? So we're not talking athletic performance, just aesthetics. Definition plays such a big role in how muscular and fit you look. You know, mm -hmm. like, like I said, I've lost weight, but because I'm leaner, I get comments like, you look like you put on muscle and mass. Yeah. And then on the flip side, I remember this used to happen all the time, especially with female clients where they, they want to lose weight. Uh, you know, that was the number one goal for most people. 
And I would obviously talk to him about speeding up the metabolism. We would bump calories a little bit first, lift, lift weights to build some muscle so that we had a nice base to work with when I would have them cut later on. And sometimes on the scale, they would gain a couple pounds, right? So they'd lose a little bit of body fat, but maybe gain more muscle than they lost at first because we're bumping their calories. And they would always come to me and be like, this is so weird. I've had three coworkers come up to me and ask me how much weight I've lost. And I've actually gained two pounds on the scale. I'm like, well, the muscle gives you shape. It gives you this sculpt. Right. And so the appearance, so aesthetics is so different than just the scale, right? Or it's so different than just what the tape measure says. Uh, it's much more than that. And we often get our own way because of our own insecurities. Yeah, you, know, you guys talking about uh, fights and stuff. Did you guys see um, what Jake Paul just did? No. Mm -mm. He just bought, I don't know if he bought outright or bought into, I think he's invested in, heavily invested in the holding company over UFC. What? So he is trying to influence uh, fighter wow. pay and fuck with Dana White. No. Yes, dude. He, dude, he's he has to, okay. He's going down. Wait, how big of an event? Like, is he like? Does he have like a check out? He, check it out. Like, so, who yeah. owns the UFC? Like, what, is it Zufa? Well, the Zufa? Lazar yeah. brothers or whatever like that are the ones that I, I um, believe own it. But he. So the way I read the Fertitas? article was it was no, it's not them. It, the, the, there's a holding company. Okay. That has that has the UFC. Or has the has something to do with the insurance and the pay, a uh, fighter pay and medical stuff, right? Okay. Uh, he is bought and in, invested into them with the intentions of being able to influence their, you know, re retirement plan, their pay. Here it is, right here. Invest in UFC parent company to fix fighter pay from within and troll Dana White. Okay, but I, I think it, I think what matters a lot with that is how much he's invested because well, I, I can invest in a parent company too, but I could have no barely any say because my investment's peanuts compared to. I don't think it's peanuts, so I'm pretty sure it's a it's a healthy chunk. Uh, I don't know if he could. I don't. I doubt he owns majority, but I'm sure he got himself a board seat. Who's the fighter that uh, he just he he stopped fighting in the UFC? One of the most dominant fighters, really good wrestler. What's his name? Um, He's from he's Eastern European. Hmm. Used to wrestle bears. Come on, yeah, he's a kid. What's his name, dude? Why does nobody know what's going on right now? <laughs> it's so old, old, old. No, no, no. Just he's a recent. recent. Yeah, he's a more recent fighter. Wrestler. He just he's yeah. one of the most dominant fighters. Khabib. Yeah, thank Khabib. you. Thank you very oh. much. Jesus Christ. Weight no, class would help. Took, yeah, I'm hey, thinking of a monster <laughs> heavyweight right spell now, bro. Sal, about, you bro I got no name. sleep this week. Sal, just keep going. You said the first letter of his first name and last name. I don't know. Anyway, so he apparently sent Jake Paul. A contract or like stipulations to fight. Like, here's what I'll do if we fight or whatever an MMA fight. To, like, literally, fight could be potentially. What? Yeah, maybe you could look. Well, that he's up calling way. out Canelo right now. Oh my it, god! Yeah, he's he just called out Canelo recently too. I mean, he's like, like the what ultimate. What do you do with this guy? He's the ultimate troll right yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, what he's doing as far as keeping media. On, I mean, he's like the the Donald Trump of like fucking YouTube stars. Yeah, yeah. That's, he's he is trolling the shit out of Dana White, and he's uh, he's trending all over all the time. Oh, there you go. So uh, Khabib uh, offered him an Eagle FC contract. Now Jake Paul's team is saying that that didn't happen. Mm. So that that could be s super weird. You know what he's done, which is interesting. I don't think that would be a. A, a good fight at all. I mean, that's it could, if it's MMA rules, he would just get that would his, never happen. Yeah, but isn't he way he, bigger than Khabib? He is, but he wouldn't do it. He first of all, he wouldn't do an MMA fight. Period, and he most certainly wouldn't pick Khabib as his first MMA fight. He would yeah. do. He wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, dude. he's just trying to get all these guys to box, and that's the big knock on him is that he's taking wrestlers and jiu-jitsu guys and he's boxing them yeah, and taking and them out of uh, taking their strengths away from yeah. them and trying to put them in regardless the of, i setting. mean you got to give the kid credit though for the what what he's done i mean bro he's literally wedged himself in yeah and, and, and they ignored him but it's hard to ignore him because he keeps well doing he's just stuff like, like the heel for like all sports now well this is why i think this is this move is really interesting if he actually got a seat on the board of the parent company of ufc and actually has well, some now potential, he's got influence yeah. over Dana White. And I mean, even yeah, if, that's, that's even if it goes nowhere, troll. just purely to fuck with Dana White, it's got to be so annoying, dude, if, if you're Dana White, you know? Yeah. Oh my God, that's yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> Can you imagine him at night just like getting that news and like, he probably broke a few phones. Oh, well, dude. you know, because you're in a weird position, do you let him in and fight? In, in, uh, well, he he's his validate big, him? The big thing he's campaigning right now, yeah. uh, more than anything else, is the fighter pay. Which, by the way, I'm curious to your guys' thought on this because there's, it's real easy to be sitting on the outside exactly. as, a, as a viewer and go, 
look at boxing, compare boxing, which has been around forever and is established, the amount of money running through there, and be like, here's a boxer who just got $30 million for a fight. Right, they have way bigger purses. That's like Way, like the whole entire fight disputed. card on a UFC fight is less than one main event. Yeah, on. I have. so I have a strong opinion on that. So that's true. However, we are looking at the top boxers and looking at and forgetting the fact that almost no one else makes any money in boxing. So mm -hmm. with the UFC, although the top fighters make a lot of money, they don't make as much as top boxers, there's lots more opportunity for all these other fighters. Like you tell me- That's an interesting thought. So your your theory is that there is way more discrepancy in boxing. So there's a huge, there's a bigger gap in between boxers than there is UFC fighters. It's just the way it's, it's, the way it's uh, put out and promoted. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of how music was when uh, before YouTube and before- um, Apple iTunes, where you had music labels and you had these musicians making shit tons of money. But if you're like, if you're not that good, but you're good enough to make some money, you, you had nowhere to go. Yeah. Whereas today, there's a lot of musicians on YouTube that they maybe wouldn't get like a normal record label like they would have in the 90s, but they're, they're good enough on YouTube to make millions of dollars. So the total, so if you look at the total, I bet you there's more opportunities in MMA to make some money than mm. there is in boxing. Whereas in boxing, you either make a shit ton or you do nothing. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. 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 Do you know if that's true or you just you're just speculating? That's from from the information that I and the research I've done, that's what I believe to be true. Now I'd love for Snapple somebody to, bottle. No, no, there's nothing on that. <laughs> yeah. But I would love someone to to you this, know who's, who's in this, this random place. person. There's no more Snapple. Is this your zoo friends? Snapple is this anymore. your zoo friends again Bro, giving you yeah, fucking fight true. advice? Hey, that's such an old <laughs> Yeah, you gotta come out of the snap like I mean like Fortune cookie or something, you know, like it's something a little more relatable. <laughs> uh, nobody knows Snapple anymore. Hey, how was you guys' weekend, by the way? Did you guys all have a good week? I know you were up with your friends. Yeah, skiing oh, and it stuff. was wild. It was a wild, wild time. I was mean, it really? I forgot that like I just have no endurance for like partying or anything. Like really, I'm such an old man. Like I just can't <laughs> even. You know, like I just don't have the. So it was wild because I took a lot of the guys up that were part of uh, my initial poker group, and we have fun, and it's like. It's one of those uh, environments where it's just like a constant roast, right? Oh, so like yeah. everybody is just like, you know, up for grabs and, and it's it starts out really funny and like everybody's digging at each other and then it becomes like exhausting. Yeah. It's like, okay, what are you going to say next? Like, yeah, you got me? Yeah. So you're just like always on edge. Yeah. Like, who's, who's coming at me? Oh, man. But uh, it was funny. I took them out of their comfort zone and brought them to the, the ski slopes. And uh, it was great because they had, you could tell, like... Uh, how many of them could ride and how many couldn't out of the seven? So there was, all, yeah, so there was me and then, yeah, uh, three other guys. So so four of us went and snowboarded. Together. Oh, not all the guys went? Not all the guys went. Oh. Two of them stayed back and, yeah, or three. And so, yeah, so we went, we went up there and it was funny because... Um, <laughs> First of all, like not, we didn't have like gear for everybody. And so <laughs> my friend Bo, you like, you showed up and it was like 20 degrees. It, it was freezing. Like it was like just that, that kind of like bitter cold in the morning mm -hmm. where you're like, Ooh, and he's just wearing shorts. What? <laughs> yeah, dude. Gangster. I was like, Oh man. Yeah. He's totally gangster. Well now, was it because he's cool in shorts or because he's, he's just one of those guys that doesn't Does he ride well him? enough to wear shorts is okay. Cause well, like, I you thought, don't crash, like, you know, yeah. in like the, ski school movies yeah. you know like the guys are just rocking like yeah. you know tank tops and all that i'm like is he gonna pull this off you know like but he he knew he was gonna have to get pants at some point uh but yeah he initially like showed up wearing shorts and i, I was like dude you're a maniac did he last no, no, he had to get pants, and, oh. they're, and they're, you know when you go to buy them there, they're like a million dollars. It's like I'm sorry, bro. They're like really outrageous here. Like you're totally. He's like screwed. What's, he's like, what's the return policy? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right yeah. them with we the, the bags, that, flip into the bag. Dude, we should have figured that out. Every time I go up there, though, I get so freaking dried out. Man. Yeah, and then we had sun. Like I didn't wear any um, sunscreen. You, you or didn't anything. bring your caldera. Dude, no, I did. Like, so that was the only thing that helped. Like, it it was almost like if I was the driest of dry sponges, and then like put like a couple drops of water on it, and it's just like <laughs> suck it up. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> what I felt like on my face, dude. My lips are still just like so. What? Okay, cracked. this is the part that I don't get, and I I think I brought this. I brought this up to one of you guys. This is off air. We we're talking about this. Um, as a kid, I went up to Tahoe all the time. Never once do I remember having issues with my lips cracking and it being super dry. Now that we live, we have a place up there and we go up there a lot. I, it's so bad. 
Yeah. Well, I, I don't understand it. If, it, if as we get older, there's you're just, some. You just weak sauce now. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, really though. I mean, do you remember? Skin just do you remember up going you. up there when you were a kid? You know, what? yeah, I don't remember being all dry. And Not like, like, like I mean, it is so bad. Kids that, like, are moister. Like, <laughs> like I remember to pack the caldera. I rem- as soon as I get there, I clip. put the humidifier on. Like I do Andrew, all that stuff, that. or else yeah. I'm I'm fucked. It's that bad. You know what? I think sometimes I think a you get older and your body just you just just you're older so yep. you hurt more you get drier more you like notice things. things more i think and you're that's the oblivious other thing. that's you know, the other thing i think the other thing too is when you're a kid you don't even notice certain things like really that's what i think i think I, you said that to me and i'm like i don't know bro like yeah. i mean I, my my lip will split and like you can't not think about that the whole time you're there yeah. like every oh. time i bite something it splits open more and it's bleeding like it i don't hurts. know so you want to know what's interesting when I used to train, uh, I, I used to train sur- a lot of surgeons at one point, and one of them told me that l- when you do surgery on kids, he goes, it's so strange, because you'll do a surgery on an adult, and they'll sit in the freaking bed, uh, yeah. I need more pain medicine, can I take two weeks off? And then with the kids, they'll hop up and run around, you have to stop them. And he's like, they don't know yeah. that they're supposed to be in bed and mm. hurting. Have you ever seen a kid like that? Like yeah. I remember when I was a kid, we would play outside, you n- almost never would come home without being scraped up from falling on the concrete or whatever. I didn't uh-huh. care. It's all a mindset. Yeah. I think that's a big part well, of it. There you it's go. A Doug, lot of Doug it just pulled it up. Aging makes skin more susceptible to dryness. Dry skin in, in older adults can be simply a sign of age related skin Boom. changes or yeah, Adam see, coming in with the science today. Well I was looking at, I was trying to give Sal like a science layup right there. I thought yeah, maybe I he'd have the answer. I have no studies it. on yeah, this. So, right. yeah, <laughs> I thought he'd have hey, a good hey, explanation. This is in, this is in, he's like, you know, it's hey, you're getting he, old, bro. Hey, he's tired today. <laughs> hold on a second. Hey, guys. Hold on a second. The name of this website is Today's Geriatric Medicine. So I mean, how old are they talking here, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is a good excuse Today's for you, Adam. You know what's okay, so back back to this to the sponsor um Caldera. So you know what's interesting about that? I, you and I could not have any di- more different skin. I know. Obviously, different sides of the shade spectrum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also, you like humidity. Like I hate it. My I'm skin, like- my skin is oily. It just uh-huh. is. It's just very, very oily. Your skin is more on the dry side. We both use the same product. I was afraid at first to use Caldera because it's a serum. It's oil. And yeah. I'm like, why would I put oil on my oily ass yeah. face? I'm going to look Doubling like- Doubling up on oil. Yeah, I'm going to look like a stereotypical olive oil, you know, Sicilian walk around. No, it actually balances out my skin. Mm. So it's got like this balancing effect, whether you're oily or dry, yeah, which is, yeah, I think, one strange. of the reasons why it's super popular. Oh. Anyway, we went down to San Diego. Oh, a couple things. So first off, it was the first time we'd been around for, away from the baby. Oh, uh, how did that- uh, Okay, so- move. Who was, remember you guys asked me this, so who was the first parent to like give in and check in on the, on the, on the baby? Um, I mean, we were both kind of checking. It wasn't a big deal. Jessica did so well. I oh. thought maybe she would kind of worry and freak wow, out. Wow, that's awesome. Now, the good, the, one of the factors that probably contributed that was the, you know, he was with my mom. So when they're with someone that you really trust and whatever, yeah. I think that yeah. kind of takes away some of the nerves. But no, it was a good time. So we went down there for Christina Rice. So she launched um, her book. Yeah. She's in that spiritual kind of realm now where she talks about manifesting your future and it's which is I don't understand much of it, but yeah. I do really appreciate Christina. And I was there and it was a big event, right? So like, you know, I don't know, hundred people were there and uh they were all there to see her and she does this speech or whatever. And I'm watching this and she's still she's I think she's still in her twenties, so she's still a young lady. And I remember when we first met her as a kid. I remember we called it. We oh, saw her yeah. as a and a lot of people don't know this. We met Christina. She's Christ- a little closer. We met her. She was only like 19. No, she was in her early 20s, I would say. Oh, really? Yeah, I'd say like 21, maybe, or 20. Oh, yeah, she was a baby. I she was a kid. I right? thought she wasn't even old enough to drink, I thought, when we first met. Maybe 20, right? Yeah, so, I think we, so. great story. So, I don't know, six years ago, five, six years ago, early days of Mind Pump, one of the strategies to grow the show, show was to get on as many podcasts as possible. Yes. And we used to do these podcasts. Podcasts hard. Yes, we do these podcast runs, right? So, Adam and I went down to LA. And scheduled like seven podcasts in like two days. And we're going to be back to back. And one of them canceled. And I remember, you know, our assistant calls us. Hey, you got a cancellation. Do you guys want to just take that break? We're like, no, find someone else. Well, Christina had this little podcast at the time and had been contacting us. She's like, do you want to get on this girl's podcast? It's small. And we're like, yeah, let's do it. Whatever. We show up and this kid in her little apartment answers the door. Two big ass grown men. And she was super assertive. No, like she wasn't shy or intimidated, sat us down, ran the whole podcast. And Adam, I'll never forget, we left. We made, we made, we became friends with her and we left and we're like, she's going to do something one day. Yeah. It's great to watch her 
you know, do that stuff. So it's really, really cool to watch. So you know, we had a good time down there. I know. I wish I would have been there. Been Speaking fun. of our podcast friends, um, I have to bring up the uh, the dumb kid that decided to go after Max Lugavir this this weekend. Oh gosh, what? Got what happened with that? You didn't see that? Oh, you didn't see that? No, I was, dude. I was in a whirlwind. So you know, there it, he made a mistake. So well, this is really popular, right? Where you you do like a clip of you know somebody else talking. Oh, and you roast them. You roast, and you basically you make pick, faces right, or pick something. A, pick it apart. Yeah. And so there's this kid. I forget his name. Maybe Doug can pull it up. Uh, the uh, BD Carpenter, B something like something like that, yeah. right? So we'll look. We'll put it. We'll put it in the show notes, and then we'll definitely have a clip right here that Andrew can put up so people can see exactly what he did and said. First of all, it's it's completely anti-science to say that there's no such thing as a good and bad food. Anti-science is a strong claim. Are you saying there is zero research to support this? And the bad foods are the foods that drive you to overeat. These are the ultra-processed foods that by the time you've eaten them to satiety, you've already over-consumed them. I mean, that's true. Ultra-processed foods do tend to be easier to overeat on average. But the properties of food, how we talk about food, these are separate. Referring to foods as good or bad is a characteristic of black and white or dichotomous thinking. Multiple research papers have concluded that rigid attitudes tend to be linked with worse outcomes. Dichotomous thinking may make it harder to maintain a healthy weight. There is an actual eating disorder scale based around it. Hence the discussions around whether having a more flexible attitude towards food would be helpful. I personally quite like this review. My partner wrote it. Not referring to foods as good or bad is not pretending that all foods are equally nutrient dense or appetite regulating. It is acknowledging that taking a massive fucking spectrum of foods and splitting it into two simple lists may fuck with people's psychology a bit. But I mean, it was Max on our show and it was Max talking, Sal and Max were talking about good and bad foods. You know, is there such mm. a thing? And why is this whole movement to just say there's no such thing as bad foods and that's and like why why is that and so it's literally like a 15 second clip that somebody had clipped of him yeah so it's no missing context oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's missing an hour that's and a half so, of context uh, right that's so annoying and so this kid is pretty much is picking the whole thing apart and and roasting uh, Max about it and so I mean I, I got on there I think Sal ended up getting on there and the thing that I I, I just don't like about this and I remember and I I said this on uh, on my story that. You remember when we were going to do this? Remember we shot all the green screen in here and we were going to go yeah, through YouTube we were channels? Yeah, through people's, uh, yeah, their YouTube channels, see their techniques and like yeah. kind of break it down. Right, and we did a we did a handful of them. And when we watched them, we all w just didn't like it. We it all negative. Yeah, it, it, it felt it negative. Douchey. Yeah, it felt douchey. It felt like all we were doing, and we don't know who these people are. Mm -hmm. we, and, and of course, uh, the original thought comes from a good place, as I think this kid is coming from. I think that he's coming from a good place. He's trying to educate his audience. But here's the problem. When you go around and you cherry pick 15 second clips off of people's content, you have no idea who you, you grab. You, you grab like somebody an who I happen to have a lot of respect for. And and I know they think there's like a bias there because he's a friend. It's like, no, if I have a friend who I think is giving out bad advice and you roast him, I can say shit. Max Lugavere's a good guy yeah. in the space. He's one of the good guys. Yes. So it's the wrong person to take something out of context and try and it's just stupid. It's yeah. A, B, it's BD Carpenter. Is that what it is? Is the guy's name. Yeah, yeah so, and so he went on, and I, by the way, I hate, I, I know where they're coming from, the whole, there are no good foods, there are no bad foods, it, you know, it's like, oh, it's everything you want it to be. No, 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 that's that's baloney. There are good and bad foods, depending Bologna's on the person. A good food. yeah. And you know what the problem, and they're saying, oh, this creates bad relationships with food. No, it doesn't. The bad relationship does not come from objectively saying that's bad and that's good. The bad relationship comes from saying, that's bad, I did that, I ate it, therefore I'm bad. Now, that's the bad relationship. Right, yeah. It's not that that's... You can objectively look in the mirror and say, ooh, I'm overweight. Some people would say that that contributes to a bad relationship with yourself. You're not overweight. It's all shapes. We're all this... No. You, you can be obese. You cannot be obese. That's okay. That's called being objective. The problem is when you say when you identify with it and say you're a bad person because of it. That's the issue. Well, mm. the, and that, the problem that I had with this was that this is exactly what we discuss on the podcast. I mean, on the podcast, we go into depth about that. And I and the thing that annoys me is that I know the, the kid who's putting out. He's got his content's pretty good. Like he's yeah. a smart. You can tell he's a smart kid. Yeah. You know, he's with um, so he fit. Remember Lane Norton's old partner? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. So they're 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 a couple, right? They've been together for like two years. Science based kid, smart, giving out good information, but the way he's doing it is just i just i think it's not i think it's tacky mm -hmm. i think it's ta it's it's a cheap way to get views and and people looking at you at the end what i don't like it is and i don't feel sorry about getting on there and roasting the kid either because it's like listen that's the risk you take by doing shit like that if you're going to yeah, pluck a 15 second clip 
and you make a fucking mistake, then you're you're gonna get it. You're gonna get it. You're gonna yeah. get it from somebody who knows that person mm-hmm. and actually knows the content they put out, read their books, and and is gonna defend that. You person. know what the problem is? The the big problem is that a lot of people, all they have in their, uh, you know, in their in their sites is growth, grow my audience, get more attention. Yep. But if but really, if you're in the space, and not everybody can be this way, but I hope that the best people in the space really are looking for good intentions for. For people at large, right? That's that's kind of like what we try to do. So could, when you pick things apart, be very careful because what you might end up doing is confusing the shit out of people to make your stupid point. Mm-hmm. Like if I say, you know, barbell squats are one of the best lower body exercises, and then some idiot gets on there and he's like, oh, I'm going to counter this, get a lot of views. Like, squats are not good for everybody. What if you have this polymorphism mm-hmm. in your femur bone? And Okay, technically, yeah. <laughs> what does that yeah. apply to? To who? And you know what you just did? You just convinced a bunch of people that yeah. squ- when that find squats hard that they don't have to squat anymore. They don't yeah. have to do anything to get better squats. And so to make your point, based you're just- on like a, a fractional percentage of people that might have like that kind of a discrepancy. Yeah. Well, the truth is this: look, there's this this movement that's happened in a lot of spaces, and it's starting to try to enter into the fitness space, and it's this non-objective. Everything is good and bad. Depends on how you look at it. You know, call it what you will. Wokeism that's trying mm-hmm. to come into fitness where they're saying things like, uh, you know, healthy and overweight or, and you ha- you can be healthy and overweight or that it's healthy to be overweight, e- even worse, right? Or there is no good and bad or, no, no, no. You, you, the, the key is you to be objective, accept it, but then don't identify with it. You're not a bad person because you don't eat perfect. Nobody does. You're not a bad person because you struggle with certain things. Everybody does. But that's o- it's okay to say, Hey, look, you know, doing cocaine on the weekends probably not good for you. It's not. It's yeah. not a good thing, yeah. right? Uh, but if you do, that doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person. I know. Well, you used did a crazy you hear example, but. Um, Jordan Peterson talking to Rogan about like wow. this kind of stuff? Yeah. Uh, yeah, about how like culture is dissolving because of like a lot of these, you know, normal like sort of standards that you know everybody sort of agreed upon are now, you know, like. There's all the the fractional considerations mm-hmm. and all the other angles that then you know sort of it just dissolves and then once it dissolves you know it sp- it spawns out even further and then the culture yeah. completely well, like <laughs> disintegrates. Yeah, what a great interview by the way. It was it was. It's I'm only a, halfway, it's a long one. I'm only halfway through right now. There's yeah. like four and a half hours. You know or what I like right? about it? it? It's one of the things that to hi- uh, highlights uh, Joe Rogan's talent because he's very different, right, as an interviewer. Yeah. But one thing that he does very well is he develops a chemistry with the person he's interviewing. Yeah, he mirrors really well. And he makes them really comfortable. And so they just go off into conversation. There's such an art to that too, by the way. Yes. Off air, we've kind of debated and argued this a little bit. I think he's a brilliant interviewer. Some yeah. people talk shit. And, oh, he's a meathead guy, and all he does is he get goes high off on talk. tangents. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think I think you're more of a fool to think that he doesn't know exactly what he's doing. Yeah. I think he's. He he prepares. He's been doing this for a really long time. You don't he, get the size of audience he has by, by just winging it. He's also yeah. curious and he's open. Even if he disagrees, he'll ask questions and likes to hear different sides. Uh, by the way, this made him and, and behind you know behind the scenes here, we called it. I we I could see what he was doing, and yeah. I'm like, he's going to be targeted. Sure enough, he is now a political target because oh, hard right now because he the, people are flocking to him because all other media is so narrated and controlled, mm-hmm. and they don't want anything that counters their message. The you know what what the story is. They just look at him as a threat and, and dangerous. He is a threat. He's because, free to speak however he wants. He doesn't fit into a box, yeah. so he's a big threat, and he talks to lots of people and it's ridiculous and they're going after him which is crazy it's ridiculous because he has people on both sides i mean he's had uh, tulsi gabbard on there he's had bernie, bernie sanders, sanders on there he's had plenty of like left wing people right wing in the middle like I, I i agree he's just curious and he's and it's funny though when he has someone like a jordan peterson like all of a sudden we want to cancel well, isn't it the up. good ideas win right yeah. like don't you need to like sift through all that to, to figure out like which way to go it's uh, such, but it's such a pussy thing. Like, yeah. okay, you disagree, get on there and debate, make your own. That's show. it. Like, like come in with argument. with better facts. Then you know what though, Rogan is very hard to cancel because he's uh, he's been very open and authentic from day one. <laughs> Yo, that where he's got tens of millions of fans, and, <laughs> and because his fan base grew with him being authentic and yeah, real. Yeah. If you kicked him off a platform, you would only make him a martyr. He yeah, would only grow definitely. in his popularity because yeah. now it's going to justify the whole like he's the counterculture. He's telling the it's truth. It's kind of crazy him. when you think that he, you know, he sold and went to Spotify and 
probably what would have been happening to him on YouTube right now had he been on uh, oh, YouTube yeah. as his main platform right now. Yeah, yeah. they would I have mean, totally de deplatformed. Don't you think so? Yeah. Like, I think that he would have. He would. 100%. This, I bet they would have been pulling stuff. So it's kind of crazy that I wonder if that was stuff that was said to like uh, like behind the scenes, like when he's mm -hmm. talking to them about because he, he he had to see the right on the wall. I mean, he moved from California. Like, well, they were already certain, pulling some of his uh, episodes on YouTube when he when he was on there. And he oh, got, were they yeah, doing he that? He was trying to work through that. Um, you know, what the reasons were and it was super vague and, and they didn't have any like real distinctive points like of, of, of contention where they're like, listen, this oh, is the for what sure you said. that was talked about there. Yeah. Right? So it's like, you know, you probably saw like patterns with that and was like, you know, I don't like this. Yeah. It's, I don't know, man. It's these artists. What was his name? Neil Young. Nobody cares. Oh, I'm not going <laughs> to put my music. Okay. That was, know? yeah, that was an interesting one. Like, so, it's so random. Yeah, the same guy. What's his famous song? Uh, uh, something in the Free Freedom, World? yeah. Oh, come yeah, on. Keep something on in the rocking in the Free yeah, yeah, Not really. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's. Yeah. I think it's ridiculous to try to cancel him uh, that way or get him kicked off. You're starting to see the the mob of people who are all following the same narrative. Oh, no, we got to get Joe Rogan off the air yeah. because- Tell us who to get next. Yeah. yeah so no. since we're talking about political stuff, cue, cue me in on what's going on up in Canada right now. The, is it like one of the craziest protests we've ever seen as far as the size of it? I think it was like over 50,000 truckers or trucks. Yeah. I, just, uh, I don't know what's true, right? I, I, I've, I've just- it's You know what's weird about Did that? Trudeau actually like get- COVID and like leave oh, or is God. they just hiding him? Right I now? don't know. That's okay. so, it's such yeah. a convenient time. But I tell you what, uh, it's there's ton, it's been almost media blackout, mm -hmm. which is really weird. It's one of the largest, most organized, peaceful protests ever. Yeah. And consider this: only fifteen percent of the truckers in Canada were unvaccinated. So that what they're protesting are vaccine mandates, not the vaccine, but to the the, the mandating exactly. Right? It's a big and, distinction. And it's way less than the 50,000 trucks that showed up, which means you have vaccinated and unvaccinated working together against these mandates. So it's a super organized um, protest. I'm getting lots of messages from Canadians who are like, yeah. this is awesome. It's, it's tyrannical. I mean, they shut down gyms again and didn't give a, a date where they were going to allow them to reopen. There's still so many people that are, are pro all that, though, dude. We just So the Warriors just played the Nets this, this Can weekend? Can we give them their own state? I don't know. Is that... So the, the yeah we live in it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. My bad. The the Warriors played the Nets this weekend, and uh, the Nets have Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving is is one of the players who has decided not to get vaccinated, and he is from New Jersey, right? So New Jersey, New York, California, some of the the hardest rules when it comes to the mandates, mm. and so he is not allowed to play in his own home home court, so he can't play at home games. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so he only plays away games because of how strict and he, cause he's decided to stick to his guns. And so that they've just figured this out. This is like never happened like this mm. in history where a player can't play he's like the best player on the team. Too, and so right? we just, we just played them in, in California, right at golden state. And they did a poll on, uh, you know, should they have allowed Kyrie to play us? Cause California has the strict yeah. rules also. Um, but they allowed him to play in the away game mm -hmm. against us and over 70, 73% said he shouldn't have been able to wow, think that yeah dude. the fact that he's decided not to get the the um vaccine you know, I, that they should look, keep him from getting paid and you know keep we did an old episode i forgot who we were with it might have been jordan shallow and this topic came up yeah. and it was old this is before everything that went down it was shallow and our stances were exactly the same and, and they're as follows if you're a private organization or company you're free to do that uh if you own a business and you say you can't come in here unless you're vaccinated it's your free yep. your freedom to associate with whoever you want you're free to associate absolutely and that's uh, that's a kind of fundamental law of of being in a free society but it also means if two people voluntarily want to meet or work together that's none of your fucking business and allowing the same entity that can jail you or fine you or legally kill you the power to force you or coerce you into injecting something in your body really do we really need to argue this like just look historically at all the crazy yeah. shit that, that that they've done in the past we're just gonna ignore completely the nuremberg is that how you uh, pronounce it yeah yeah, yeah. I, I don't like that's a bad idea and yeah. you know what's funny okay so here we are two years after it after everything has gone down Compare the states with the strictest laws to the states with the looser laws. By the way, compare total deaths, not just infections and whatever. And what you'll find is almost no difference. You have higher suicide rates. You have uh, higher rates of depression. You have economic uh, problems, which cause more deaths. We caused more problems than we were trying to solve with our overreaction. I'm going to stand by that always. And I think pe more people are realizing it. So this is so, ridiculous. Well, the, the other thing that's happening right now that I wish that you would have said 
publicly on the show because I don't think you brought it up on the show. I know we talked about it off air many times was as soon as the narrative started to change around uh, COVID and that we were starting to see it's starting to get less. You mean the fear is waning? Yeah. And and people were being less and less fearful about yep. what's going on. You were saying that this we're going to go to war. We're going to have the next thing is going to be we're going to blow the horns for, you know, some yeah. other country. What's the and, next button that you can. You know, it's, it's, here we are. Here we, we are now. We literally sat talking about, in here off camera and I literally said that. So oh, the fear is waning. They're going to start international foreign yeah. threat because that gets everybody yeah. together. So start beating the war drum. Yeah, because it, it war is a really effective way of get or the threat of war gets everybody behind the whatever the administration or the president you know is saying and sure enough that's kind of what they're doing and by the way the the, uh, the shit that's happening in ukraine has been happening for a long time but now we're beating, decades now we're beating the drums a little bit and and it's just I, I that's what i think i think it's political like hey midterms are coming up yeah. let's get everybody behind us to scare them a little bit more it's crazy that we even want to because it's a it's a bordering country to putin right and that's yeah. whole and why would we even want to go in there and i love how we try and make it look like it's him who's the crazy bastard but here we are parking our shit like right next to his borders imagine if that was done to us like imagine yeah. if, if people start well if, they did if, try to do that in cuba i know well and then what's gonna happen right yeah so that's my point like and it we try and make putin look like he's this awful person and i'm not defending the man whatsoever but the point is we are by coming in, in into into the U U ukraine we're <laughs> encroaching on well, them more than they're you know, encroaching on us your, the ukrainian president actually said that he actually yeah. said uh i know more about what's going on i'm here and the u.s president is politicizing i mean something along those lines he said that you know what the truth is the cold war showed us this we will not go to war with another nuclear armed country it's just not going to happen if it would have happened it would have happened in the cold war believe me it was a close call but nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to go to war because nobody wins. Everybody, yeah. you know, ends up dust. So this is a lot of posturing, I think, is kind of what's going on. For sure. Not to mention Europe, a lot of European countries rely heavily on Russian fuel and energy. So I think Germany's like 50% of their yeah. natural gas comes yeah. from- I think it's more than that. Or maybe even more. Yeah. So that's a big, you're mm. like, that's a big vulnerability type yeah. of deal. So, I mean, I'm always anti- I'm almost always. By the way, if you look at all the pretenses for, or you know, kind of how we start lots of wars, it's a lot of lies that lead up to a lot of them. <laughs> I mean, there really is there's, a lot of manipulation just to get in there, yeah, and get just, support. Yeah, yeah, it's just kind of I don't know. I mean, don't you thing. feel that? Like, I mean, with not only the fear of COVID, but then also where the economy is going, I almost feel like that it's they're they're definitely going to push that way. Like when you said it, I totally, oh yeah, I could see that happening. Where now I'm like, oh yeah, it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's with you know what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that they're gonna take this. Because I highly doubt we're going to do a war with with Russia. At most, it'll be proxy. Like we'll support Ukraine with like weapons and stuff. Mm -hmm. But here's why. Here's what I would be afraid of. We would never fight. I don't. We very unlikely that we go full on war with with Russia. It was two nuclear armed countries. Same thing with China, see that right? Yeah. But I could see us using that to target Iran, which we've been trying to mess with for a long time. Iran's not nuclear powered. And we'd love to go in there and, and you know, based off of how they've talked in the past and because they're kind of allied with Russia, I would, it would be interesting to see them twist it into something to, like to Iran. Well, I mean, look how we did that with Iraq and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. right. which is pretty, you mm -hmm. know, pretty funny. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Speaking of which, did you guys read this article? Did you guys see that they changed the ending of Fight Club in China? Wait, what? Okay, wait. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, dude. you told me about Remind it. Remind me. You never ending. like fulfilled me in on that. Remind me the ending. I, I can't even yeah. picture so, right now what happens. Yeah. So remember at the end, he he shoots himself and kind of kills the alter ego, which is uh, Tyler, Tyler Durden, Durden, right? Yeah. So he knows That's when he's sitting up at the top of the building and he's yeah. in the chair. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then he sits down, and then the girl comes up or whatever, and then they watch the buildings of the credit, you know, unions or whatever credit companies right. explode. Yeah. So at the end of it, he does cause anarchy or whatever. Well, the Chinese government said, we won't release this in our country unless you change the ending. And in the ending, the new, what a shitty ending, the authorities win. He gets caught by the authorities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. You'll never get away with it. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that funny? You're under our thumbs. Yeah. Kind of Did you guys know that that's happened, that movie endings have been changed in different countries before? You no, want to know? I didn't know that was a thing. That's funny, dude. One of the, one of the, one of the ones that I was aware of as a kid, 
I was a big Godzilla fan as a kid, mm -hmm. and I used to watch all the Godzilla. Oh, films. I heard about this. Yeah, it was because it was so. It's Japan, right? That has um, Godzilla, Godzilla is Japanese, right? Yeah. So like, and, and then King Kong is American, American, and so like in America they showed King Kong winning, and then you know Japan just of course. you know of course competitive. Yeah, yeah isn't yeah. that funny? Yeah, I didn't know that. So you could I I've never seen the version where Godzilla wins. I've always tried to find. I want, okay, so they have that to like interesting. you have to like negotiate that before you right before you play it or the rights to that like you can't just take somebody's art like that well, so and change that, it and then sell it in your country maybe They've the film it. owner knows that right? they have like, to yeah and then they create that yeah i'm sure what market. happens is that someone like japan or china whoever decided comes in and says listen um we're not going to play this in our country or we will give you you know 30 million dollars for the rights to to bring in our country, but then we will, we're we'll going change to change. A little we're bit. going to change in, and yeah. I'm sure they go okay. Well, I know the Godzilla one was made in Japan, and they wanted to sell it in the U.S., so they made the alternative ending, thinking it would sell better in the U.S. Oh, so they mistaken. did it for us. They did it for us. Uh, uh, with China's done some interesting stuff though. They've done stuff where they're like replace this uh, this African American doctor with a Chinese doctor because yeah. we want to make sure that the doctor's Chinese or. Uh, this anti-government, you know, speech right here, cut this out or whatever. And uh, th they've done that to lots of movies. Oh, yeah. So that Seth Rogen movie, you remember the one, not the dictator. The end one? The the one where they're in North Korea. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm so surprised that, yeah, the interview, that yeah. that was still released. Because wasn't there like a lot of contention, especially like- It was right around that time, too. Yeah, North Korea was getting all heated about it. I uh, know, that was yeah, it was a great like, movie, by the way. It was funny. Yeah, hell it was hella funny. funny. They hate us because they ain't yeah. us. Yeah. Anyway, so. I got I to bring up a study that I think is very interesting. Interesting. So uh, Jessica got back. So we had the little Juve Go unit, the small one that you like use on your face. She yeah. gave it to her grandma for a while and we got another one for ourselves. So now she has it again. She's using it again. And I can always tell after about a week and a half, two weeks of her using it regularly, like you could see it in her face. She, it's like less, it just looks more supple or whatever. Or and, vibrant. Ooh, good word. And, yeah. And she's like, supple. I think she goes, does red light affect acne? Because every once in a while she'll break out just a little bit. You know, you can't really tell. She's got really good skin. But she's like, I feel like it affects acne. So I had no idea. I looked it up. Red light therapy reduces inflammatory acne by over 60% Wow! in studies. And non-inflammatory type acne, like whiteheads and blackheads, by over 50%. Hmm. That's huge. Wait, wait, spin, explain the difference of acne. There's so, the, so there's whiteheads and blackheads, which is essentially clogged, like a clogged pore or whatever. Okay. And that causes a problem. Then when it becomes inflamed, there's a, like a small amount of bacteria that causes an infection. So that's when it gets kind of red yeah, or, whatever. or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. So reduced inflammatory, because it reduces inflammation, speeds up the healing process, kills some of the bacteria apparently. So six, over 60% reduction I read in a study wow. with red light therapy. I did not know on that. acne. Dude. Just that's a, interesting. So many benefits. Dude, well, that's that a big so deal random. because try and find an over-the-counter market that does 60 that reduces acne by 60%. Yeah. You're not going to. Yeah. Especially not if you have cystic, you know, acne. Now, will she cuz you guys have I saw you got We have the big one. You have the yeah. big one mounted in your room, which I want yeah. I want to do the same thing. I don't mind like leaning against something. I want to mount mm -hmm. it like that. Um, does she use that one too or use the go one and like what's the I mean obviously the go is nice cuz you could probably prop it up where she, yeah. wherever she's sitting and and it hit it on her. At, she mainly uses the go because she likes to use it on her face. Yeah. Um, That's the, how Cassie uses Cassie, when she does all computer work for us, she just sets it up on her desk, like right here while she's mm -hmm. working and just, just rotates it from left to right like that and just mm -hmm. blasts while she's doing it. Oh, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But the, the big one I'll use sometimes for recovery and stuff. You know what the issue is? You have to use it consistently. You don't, you're don't. you not going to get anything after yep. one. Yeah, you don't notice it unless it's been a long yeah. string. You put it in your routine, 10 minutes, you know, maybe every other day uh, or every day. Yeah. And you, you, I swear, it's. I can tell. I'll come home. I won't even know she's been doing it. And I'll look in her face and be like, you've been using the, the, the juve again. Yeah. She's like, oh yeah, you could totally tell, huh? I've wanted, so what I want to do, and I wonder if there's a listener who's done this, is I want to mount it um, like in the bathroom by my shower. So mm -hmm. I can, so I want to do it where I'm like naturally getting naked all the time, where all I'd have to do is maybe stand there for a few, because I'm already showering and I have glass for my thing. So I can mm -hmm. be shooting it on me while I'm showering, then drying off. And then when I get ready, just maybe a few more minutes, I wait there. And if mm -hmm. I did that like every single day, because that's the only thing is sometimes I'm really good about being consistent with it. And then other times I fall off for a little bit and I definitely know the difference. You can tell it's not one of those things where you do it and then it's like you get the benefits and then they stay with you forever. It's like you have to It's stick. like exercise. Yeah. It's kind of one of those consistent things. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you had brought this up last week about there was a new book. Uh, Scotty Pippen had written it and he had talked shit about uh, Michael Jordan. Oh, yeah. Did you learn any more about this? So, uh, I mean, 
so that there's a lot there's a lot of theories that that's why he did it right because he's got a book and then he has something else that he has coming out. He was and, just in the Last Dance, uh, and uh, so that, the rumor is that that's part of what made him upset is the way Jordan talked about him in the Last. What did he say? I never watched it. Wasn't it. Even that bad, I was it? I totally don't agree with the guy. So it's yeah. hard to like even explain like where he's coming from. It's just the way that they talk about Pippen as like the other guy, you know, the versus like how. Uh, important he was to all those titles, which he was. I mean, he was a he was a very important player. Yeah, but your teammate was Jordan, right? Like, but and on. I don't and I honestly I don't feel like Jordan has ever uh, not given him credit. Like yeah. I don't. I, but everybody else makes it so much about Jordan that it's made him. So what did he say in this book and stuff? Like what's he talking? about? I mean, I haven't read the book, so I don't know the exact uh, exact verbiage that he used. But he was basically just talking shit about Jordan and just a, a, he's an egomaniac and it's all about him and like well and like what all he did and that he didn't get any credit for it. And so I, I, all of it, I think, is a ploy to get people to buy his book. He's been mm. irrelevant Have for a, drum up a, some a long time, yeah. and so I think. Getting some controversy. Anyone who sees the cover of that book, Pippin, Pippin. How much blah, of that blah. do you think was uh, directed by um, you know the publishing company and wanting him to like, you know that's drum a, it up? that's an that's an interesting thought. Like you know, would they do something like that? Would they ask him to do that? There's a most people think he he's been bitter and sour. Yeah, for but a at long the end of the day, he's responsible. Well, yeah, he's got his name on the book. I'm yeah. not saying he's absolved of that, but I'm just like like him like trying to think of some ways to get an angle of like controversy. I think there. it was his idea. I yeah. think he I think he's been bitter and sour I uh, for a long time um, and it's been said about that about him because he's made comments like in interviews before like subtle comments um, before where people are like oh that was kind of a hater comment mm -hmm. why would you say that uh, so I think that I actually think it, it came from him for sure. I think, mm -hmm. and then with the last dance just coming out, what a couple of years ago, which it yeah, probably, it was all about Jordan. Basically. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, that's a lot of the critics are going like, "What the fuck, bro? Like, this is yeah. your boy." You guys, you guys, I hate that man. It reminds yeah. me of when Jose Canseco came out and was talking crap oh, yeah, about everybody, and yeah, oh, it's yeah, like, it's like listen, and when people were like, uh, you know, with uh, Lance Armstrong, it's like. Man, you're on a team together. Like, what happened to loyalty? You know what right. I'm saying? Like, if you do a bunch you're of You're all there doing it with them. Look, here's the bottom line. You do a bunch of dirt with your friends and you're part of it, you don't get to say shit later about <laughs> your friends. You yeah. can talk about yourself all you want. Yeah. But talk about your... You were there with them yeah. when you were Just doing this Just because you're shit. less successful or, like, didn't have as many accolades, you know? You're going to throw everybody else I lose the bus. so much respect. Yeah. You know? Like, if, if you want to talk shit about yourself and what you did in the past, that's fine. But you talk about the dudes and people you ran with in the past, and you all did it together. You just sound like it's a, weak. I mean, just yeah, think you, these these athletes. Okay, most of them, right? I'm obviously, overgeneralization to say all of them, but most of them uh, have massive egos. Yeah, mm -hmm. they were all the best, of course, where they came from. Yep. And when you are a guy like Scotty, who who is arguably one of the best ever, like he's a great, great player, yeah. right? And you got to play in the shadow. Of the greatest of all time, sure. yeah, you know, it's tough on the ego. And everybody, whenever they talk about those Bulls, those championships, it's always Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, or Michael Jordan and the rest of the team. It's never Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan yeah. took on all the stuff. And so, yeah, I bet that's uh, I bet that's been eaten away with them. Now, the the irony is this: Scottie Pippen was actually paid more in the final years of of playing for the Bulls wow. than than Jordan was. I didn't know that. Has Jordan signed an earlier contract? Before the contract started getting really crazy, so I can't remember if it was like a ten year or what, but it was a bigger it was a bigger contract earlier that Jordan had, and Pippins came up later later after mm -hmm. they had won some of the championships, and so he was he was being paid more. So that's the part that I think yeah. is really annoying. It's like, bro, you were making more money than Jordan, and and you don't hear him bitching about I didn't get paid as much as as Pippin did. Like that, he's all sour about it. It's like, dude, you got paid, dude. You know what's funny? It's huh. like you know how many good you know how much good music art innovations and whatever we're we missed because of egos when it comes to teams like mm. how many oh, like, bands how many broke bands up. broke up because they got popular and they can't handle that the lead singer gets all the attention and the drummer's like what about me or whatever or, you know it's ridiculous like it, you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't the fact that you guys are team just work together and, yeah. and again the loyalty part is really weird to me it's like there's uh, no loyalty the left. ego ego is a very 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 powerful thing it is it's, yeah. you know what though i have to say this though i'm i'm saying this is a 42 year old man these guys were in the the, the pro, their prime popularity. What in their twenties? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I mean, yeah. I, I wasn't very. <laughs> I definitely wasn't very. Well, we, I mean, as, as grounded and balanced. We yeah. say it all the time. If if this would have started if when we were twenty five, it wouldn't be where it's at today. And a lot, all of that has to do. It, was, it wouldn't have to do with us being good or not good trainers, or even our experience. Because most of us had enough business experience under our belt. It's literally Egos. the ego. 
we would, you know, it's really easy when you're broke and or you're a rookie, right? You're just coming in, and you're and we have this common goal to be great, to make lots of money, to be successful, right? And then when you reach that goal, that's where things get like all crazy because it's like we didn't think beyond that. When we were we were so tunnel vision on winning, we are so tunnel vision on scaling this company. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't think that we would have there would have been any mishap between us if we we're twenty five in the first couple of years while we were building. We would have had our heads down yeah. and like grinding. And you start actualizing some of the success of it. That's yeah, right. That's, that's when, and that's the same thing goes for like these athletes. It's like when you're when you're when you're nobody, when you just get drafted, when you're early. It's like we all have this common goal. Then success happens. Then the money comes in, and now it's more than just that because you've reached that, and so now you have to look deeper yeah. within what I want. And a lot of these guys don't realize. Oh wow, it really wasn't about winning. I want. The acknowledgement. I want to be known as the guy who built this. Mm-hmm. I want to be known as the the leader of the team. Like, so that's you know when that the irony of that in. is. As yeah. you get, I don't know if this is true for everybody, but as I get older, like way less. That's way less. Not only is it less important. I'd rather not. I'd rather be. I'd rather not. Well, be. that's your wisdom. Yeah, I'd rather yeah. be behind the scenes. That's oh, your. Yeah. That's your wisdom going. Yeah. Like you've seen what all that attention causes, yeah. as I do too. I, I think all of us. All of us are yeah. like, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so uh-huh. We talk all the time about man. When are we going to build this thing big enough that we can fucking get away? Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Walk away. Get behind so nobody has access to us because you see what happens to a lot of these people that that want that attention so yeah. bad. It's like then they get it and they're like, oh fuck. This you know, is this not is cool. this is one of the number one reasons why I think one of the worst thing that could ever happen to a young kid is to get famous. Mm-hmm. That's got to be one wow. of the worst things ever. Famous or just a, a, a windfall of money, right? Like yeah. just an mm-hmm. ungodly you're, you're, amount of you money. You're that, 18, 19, and you got all these people fawning over you, telling you everything. I mean, imagine when you were 18, if everybody told well, you that everything you said was great. Yeah. How you, how little you would have grown. You have nothing to keep you grounded and balanced or anybody checking you on your bullshit. No, and then when- it's too inevit- much power too early. Yeah, and yeah. then inevitably when you're not as popular, how crushing that would be when yeah. you're a kid and you grow up with that and now- you know, you were a child star. Oh, you're so cute. You're so great. Oh, my God. And then you go through puberty. Oh, nobody pays attention to you anymore because you're going through the ugly stage, which happened to a lot of child stars. And then they get on drugs and they get oh. they, they commit suicide. Yep. Oh. Not not cool, man. People think it's great, but nope, it doesn't work that way. Overrated. Hey, what's up, everybody? Look, one of the issues with eating a high-protein diet, especially if you're trying to build, so you've increased your calories, digestive issues. It can really get in the way, cause a lot of inflammation and bloat, and stop you from getting to your goals. Well, one thing you could try are digestive enzymes. Digestive enzymes help you assimilate your proteins, fats, and carbohydrates more effectively, help improve your digestion. But not any digestive enzymes. You want to go with a company that understands athletes. That's why we work with Masszymes. They make digestive enzymes for people like you. And of course, because you listen to Mind Pump, we got a discount for you. So if you're interested, head over to mindpumppartners.com. Click on Bio-Optimizers. Okay, that's the company that makes Masszymes. Click on that and then use the code MINDPUMP10, MINDPUMP10 for 10% off your order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Jamie Mendez PR. How can you progress using body weight training and still make gains? This is actually a good question because I'd say the challenge with body weight resistance training is, is, is exactly that. Like, how do you progressively it's load the hardest part? The body. How do I increase the resistance when my body weight is no longer sufficient? It's for the exercise, right? It's only I think it's it's only a difficult question when you you think of it in the context of progressive overload is always adding more weight. Mm-hmm. There's many ways that you can progressively o- overload the body without and we've we did a whole episode by the way dedicated to this. I think it was like called like nine many, nine many ways. different ways to I think it was like nine way nine different ways to progressively overload the body. Something like that. Maybe Doug could look it up while we're talking, but that that's why this seems uh, like a difficult uh, problem is like oh god well i can't what am i gonna do keep wearing sandbags it's like you don't have to overload the body all the time with that here's one slow down yeah. slow down the tempo Way down slow the tempo down or incorporate isometrics do mm-hmm. a, do do slow down the tempo pause at the bottom and mm-hmm. hold for five seconds uh increase the reps yeah. at speed go something that's uh explosive right like, so there's a lot of different ways that you can yeah. overload change the, body. the angle get more gravitational forces working against you that's right um yeah so you do have to get a bit creative it seems because it's not just like um just adding a load is going to go ahead and um provide that that type of uh, progressive overload you have to get you have to work with the other acute variables the other factors there tempo um you know it, intensity with um you know like holding in like you mentioned with the isometric training and with um, you know difficulty that way yeah i i, I do want to i, I want to add something else though because i think 
that's part of it, but I don't think that's the main thing, actually. I'm going to disagree a little bit. Uh, not that you guys are wrong or totally right, but I think the big one is that most people don't know more than the basic calisthenic exercise or bodyweight exercise. So people know push-ups, pull-ups, you know, sit-ups, lunges, but they don't realize that like with a pair of rings, there's a whole bunch of very, very challenging, high tension, mm -hmm. high resistance bodyweight exercises that you could do. Um, and there's just a whole bunch of them. So I would say like, okay, yes, there's your traditional exercises and yes, you could progress those. Like I could go from a body weight squat to like a pistol squat, for example, uh, which dramatically increases the load, right? I could do push-ups elevated, bring them all the way down to the floor, maybe even elevate my feet. Like that's one way to do it. But you grab a pair of rings, which are very inexpensive, or you could use just suspension, you know, trainers, which are very similar. And now you've opened up a whole plethora of different yeah. exercises where you can really make the resistance high and advanced. I mean, look at uh, yeah, look at gymnastics. Yes. I mean, that's probably your best example of how they figured out how to um, make the intensity increase the intensity and also like progress you into uh, moves that you couldn't achieve before. So you know now I can I can do a muscle up. Yeah, you know, just from uh, starting off being able to do good pull ups to where I could get, you know, my body up higher and higher or get like, uh, you know, ring dips where I have to go super low so I can work on all the transitions, mm -hmm. which then builds strength to then accomplish even new feats. So I, I really think this is just a, it's an, a lack of understanding how you can overload the body because I see this even forget body weight. This is a question that I think the average lifter gets and their their answer always is. A different machine or adding load all the time to yeah. it but there's i mean you could keep squat push up body body row or pull up and 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 manipulate that so many different That's ways true. to keep overloading the body you don't even need to get creative you don't need mm -hmm. to go do any crazy exercises you can incorporate like i was saying isometrics in there you can incorporate tempo you can incorporate a plyometrics and explosiveness Pausing. you combine some of those variables like all I mean, you could literally not mess with the handful of body weight exercises and just manipulate all those variables and continue to see results in the body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think that's the problem is because I see this even with people that have the gym membership and have access to all the equipment. We always think that, oh, to get stronger, and you know, I got to just keep adding weight to the bar, and that's not true. Yeah, I mean, you make a really good point yeah. uh, because at some point, even with – traditional free weights, the answer is not to add more weight, right? At some point, the risk versus rewards, you know, ratio starts to become a little bit not so great. Like when I was squatting 150 pounds for 10 reps, and that was a real intense set for me, going up to 160 and then 170, like that's, there's a lot of reward to risk, right? Once you get up to, for me at least, once I got up to 350, 400 or more, I could add 10 more pounds if I'm stronger, but now the risk versus reward ratio doesn't look the same. Now, if my form's off a little bit, which sometimes it is, my chance of, of injury goes up. So now, you know, if, once you get to a certain level, you're going to have to That's right, diminishing look at returns. all, you're going to have to look at all these different things. Like, uh, yeah, you could add 10 pounds to your 600 pound deadlift, but you might be better off slowing down, pausing, doing, you know, changing the way that you do the lift to make it more challenging. Here's something that really good lifters know how to do. They can take an exercise that they could do for 15 reps to failure, and they can fail at five reps mm -hmm. if they wanted to, just by changing the feel and the squeeze. Mm -hmm. I did this today, you know, doing pull-ups. I think if I go max out pull-ups and just rep them out, I can get close to 20. But if I really stretch, really like squeeze, ten hell hard, yeah, you squeeze your body like yeah. super hard doing these, making like a more intense like full body tension yep. workout out of yep. it. You can do a lot to these exercises. Yeah, so. You just got to get creative with some of that stuff. Isometrics is a big one. I tell you what, like especially if you have something that's immo Im like immovable, like if you have chains attached to the ground or something and you're driving against that, like the force you generate is the force you generate. You get stronger, you just generate more force. As long as the chains hold steady, you're progressively overloading every time you do a max effort with isometrics, and that's a very overlooked uh, part of resistance training. Nobody, you know, isometrics, I believe in the future – it's going to make a resurgence like everything old that's good yeah. does. And people are going to rediscover the value of it. And you need almost no equipment to do it. In fact, with intrinsic tension, you need no, no equipment at all. But if you're more advanced, like I said, you could use something immovable, which is, requires so little space, and you get tremendous benefits. Next question is from Helen Ack. 
What are the pros and cons of using a lifting belt? Oh, good. See, usually the question is, do I need one or why should I use one or not? But mm. I like this. Pros and cons. I do think there are pros and cons to a lifting belt. So the obvious one is, well, if you're going to compete in an event that allows you to use a, a lifting belt, you should train in one because there's a skill and technique to it and you just want to get good at it. Um, but now let's talk about the pros and cons for the average lifter. One of the cons of lift of using a lifting belt is that it, it's a different form of core stability, or uh, to put it differently, it's a different muscle recruitment pattern with core stability with the belt. So when you wear a belt, you've got this external force or, or external thing around your waist, and the way that your core develops uh, or creates stability with a belt is it pushes out against the belt, and then that creates more stability. When you don't wear a belt, it's a little different. So it's, it's a lot of activation of the core in both of them, because the argument used to be, oh, you wear a belt, you get less core activation. Not true. Mm -hmm. You get just as much core activation. It's different, though. I mean, the argument you can make, though, Sal, is it's a lot different. It's, I mean, it, it's it is. the complete opposite. Yeah. One of them, you're training to push the Basically core out. drawing in and bracing. The other one, you're, out. Yeah, you're teaching to draw in, which are different skills. It's different skills. So that would be a con, right? Like, why would you want to get stronger in a way in the gym that you're not going to be able to really apply as much in everyday life? So there's one con. Now I'll give you a pro. The pro is it, it can allow you, because it does provide some more core stability you probably generate on your own, it does allow you to overload some really strong body parts like legs, so like squats with the belt. Mm. You'll be able to add 10, 15, 20. Some people can add 30 more pounds when they know how to use a belt really well. Um, deadlifts, you can use more weight, so now you can overload the back a little bit more. Overhead press, for some people, it allows them to lift 10, 15 more pounds with their shoulders. So there's that argument there. So you know that would be, I guess, the two pros and cons. I will say this. I almost never had an everyday client yeah. use a belt. Almost never. But also, full disclosure, I use a belt. I use a belt when I squat and I deadlift. And that's just because I trained that way since I was a kid. Yeah. And I'm too lazy to train well, out of it. Other than, yeah, competing. I mean, I have pretty much all cons. But um, in terms of, I was trying to think of that in terms of like breathing or like belly breathing. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have a belt on where it's advantageous to focus on pushing out and bracing in that fashion. I don't know if that correlates, which I don't think it does. Like I, I can't think of a real life application without the belt where you're trying to, you know, promote that type of a mechanism. But um, yeah, like for the most part, I just, I think it's good. Like let's say in, in a situation where you're really uh, pressing yourself to kind of go beyond your, your natural limits yeah. um, to acclimate to a belt and then start, to build that type of strength and, and support uh, because it does, I mean, here's the thing, when you have really heavy weight, uh, you don't want to have to be conscious of too many things at the same time. You want to kind of have that uh, aid and support when mm -hmm. it's it's a competitive environment. So I, I definitely see some benefit to that. Well, an another pro, uh, when you walk in wearing a belt, you look serious. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, especially you know if your name's on it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Beast. I That's mean, right. it's, yeah. 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 If you, you have make a nickname a or your last name on the back of your belt when you walk in, not many people think that it's your first time in the gym. So there definitely is a little bit of street cred that comes with carrying a belt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as a pro. Honestly, I, I'm kind of like Sal. I don't use it as much as Sal does, um, but I have trained myself to use it. So I do like to pull it out every once in a while. Not very often, though. Like, I have to be chasing a PR or like really going heavy for the day for yeah. me to pull it out and just kind of see where I'm at. And the truth is, uh, what I know now, uh, if I were to, if I was starting all over on my weightlifting journey, knowing that I have no desire to be a power lifter and get into that category at all, I probably would never use one. I agree. Because, because same thing. Yeah. I mean, I just, but I have used it enough times that I know how to use it. And so it's an advantage, right? So like I, I can deadlift and squat and overhead press more weight with the belt than I can without. Yeah. So it's purely an ego thing. Sometimes I feel like getting in there and pushing more weight than I normally would push. And so I know I can strap the belt on and I know I can get an extra 3% to 5% out of my lift. And so I yeah. do it. But if I were to train a client or train myself from from the base uh, up again 
I wouldn't use it because it doesn't have, to your point, Justin, it doesn't have any real application in the real world. And in fact, if anything, it could crutch you because you're used to pushing out on that. And if you were in real world, bending over to pick the couch up or my son or do something and I were to try and brace that way, uh, I could potentially hurt myself instead of bracing inward and supporting myself like you're supposed to. Yeah. You know, I got to ask you uh, if this is still a thing. Uh, in the physique world in terms of wearing the belt as sort of a waist shaping yeah. waist trainer. Yes. Yep. Yes. And it's part it's of still happening. It's part of the justification uh, for them to defend themselves when they get caught doing a tricep push down on the cable machine. Mm. So if you get if you catch a men's physique bodybuilder guy uh, doing tricep push downs or cable curls and they have the belt on you're almost certain that they're doing it with the intent of they have it sucked in really tight like a waist trainer and they think they're shrinking their waist. Yeah. So I've seen people wear weight belts on so seated dumb. machine exercises. Yeah. Like, wow. Well, it, yeah. Became, wow. it became a very uh, popular fashion statement in the last decade or so. It really it wasn't that... I don't remember it being that popular when we were first like lifting. You know who popularized it for a second? Mm. Uh, Charles Glass. Uh, he, by the way, one of the best bodybuilder trainers uh, ever, right? And and this is this. I had to say that because there's a difference between a bodybuilder trainer and a if you trained everyday average person. When you're training these highly developed, extreme, extremely gifted genetic, you know, anomalies who are on anabolic steroids and all that stuff, then sometimes this kind of stuff makes sense. It's an extreme sport, and that's what he did. He would put his athletes in a weight belt because remember the issue started happening in the nineties where bodybuilders would get so big, they'd get that distended belly. Uh, and so yeah. he says that it, it helped. I don't know if it did or not, but that's kind of why it became popular and why you would see them wearing a belt when they did seated, you know, bicep curls and stuff like that. The irony of that though, is I would actually make the case that that probably made it worse because it, again, like you said, it, it trains, yeah, it trains it the core to push out versus draw in the vacuum maneuver yeah. and teaching uh, bodybuilders to do the vacuum yeah. more. I think would have tremendous value because sure. then you would be you naturally kind of hold your stomach in and a also bit more. you don't you don't activate the core less by working out in the belt you right. activate it the same amount it's yeah. just activated it's different. different totally different yep. yeah I, you know here's the thing like for me I started using it as a kid because I got introduced to it by powerlifters who taught me how to squat and they told me you got to wear a belt so I did and now years ago I used to use uh, wrist straps a lot when I would work out all because bodybuilders did so I read the magazine so I did. It took me a year, maybe a year and a half, to get my grip to catch up to my back strength. I had to go through this whole process, getting my hands stronger. Getting rid of the belt now would take me another year or two to really get you know comfortable. I just don't, I'm lazy to do it. This is why I still use it. And I have a very interesting relationship with a weight belt. It's become like my cape. You know, like I pull it out. It's the same one I've had forever. In fact, I gave the one I had when I was 16 away to one of my clients because it was so tattered and beat up. And Did he, you start coming out to like dramatic movie theme song music? No. Like our friend? No, I'm not like Lane. <laughs> okay. yeah, no. no, but I had this belt forever and I gave it when I finally stopped training clients when we you know went full time with Mind Pump. I gave it to him as a gift and whatever. And I still have another one that I got when I was 19. It's the one I still, it's a blue one I still use. So I got this interesting thing with weight belts, but if I, I what you said is so true. If I could go back in time, yeah. I would have never used it because I, I, there's no need. Yeah, because you're not going to be a powerlifter. Either, either no. am I. I had no intentions to do that, and yeah. so then it really has no real reason why you would want to train with it. Yeah. Next question is from Corn on the Cob two seven three three. How much protein powder should I supplement with? I weigh 240 pounds, so eating 240 grams of protein is very difficult each day. Yeah, the short answer is as much protein powder as you need to make up the difference. Now, here's a long answer. I have experimented with this myself. I've done this with clients. Uh, for whatever reason, and I know people are going to argue with me and they're going to pull up studies and protein is protein. I have never gotten as good of results eating half of my protein from protein powder, even if all things were equal. Than if I got all my protein from food, I agree with that. So, and you were really, yeah, I agree with that. Meticulous I, about this. I did a whole, I did a whole time where, or one show where I allow myself to use bars and shakes as much as I wanted, even if it meant I had to, you know, even if I meant I had two bars and two shakes in a day to make up most of my protein, and then another time where I went all whole foods, and I just. 
I felt better. I felt I looked better. I thought I leaned out better. All on the whole on the whole foods, it just it felt better. And yeah. I know that's just my experience with it. But I specifically tested it because I, I was curious. I really thought because I had already speculated on it. Like I'd seen like my the my body just didn't look the same. And when I whenever I'd hit my protein intake from all whole foods, I just seemed to build more muscle. It just felt better. And I don't know what it was. And you were controlling calories and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would you would you um, attribute that? More to the digestion differences I, what, or the like assimilation. What I would attribute it to is that I think it's the unknown still for us. There's yeah. still there's still yeah. value in real food that we still we act like we know everything. It's so funny sometimes how arrogant we are like with science, right? Because we've come a long ways and we do know a lot. Yeah. We know a lot more today than we did fifty and a hundred years ago when it comes to nutrition. But there's still a lot of things and just there's probably something in a whole piece of chicken or steak that I'm getting that is that is helping me out more than just some dehydrated powder that yeah. is, you know condensed version of that where you know and they've and they've tried yeah. to fortify it to be as yeah, light as natural much. pairings of like right. essential nutrients the, in there. Yes, so, you're 100% right Adam because we only know what we know. Right. So we can make something as perfect as we think we can make it based off of our current knowledge. It's like baby formula. Okay? 100%. There's a, yeah, another example like right there versus, uh, and yeah, yeah. that's something very well studied that they've been there's a massive market there so you better believe there's a ton of fucking research to try and make baby formula to be just like breast milk and yet we still learn and yet we still don't every every year a new study comes out showing us something different or new about breast milk that we didn't know before yeah. same thing with food mm -hmm. we discover a new thing about food this new compound this new bioflavonoid this new whatever that's in this particular food that does this thing uh that we didn't know about before now what, so i agree with that now where science is amazing is I, I did that show where I had, you know, four shakes and bars almost every day, making it up from stuff like that. I still looked badass. I still got lean. Yeah. It's still met calorie wise. Like it's, it didn't throw off my tracking. So we've got it close enough that you're going to be okay. But boy, I, there, it just seems to be better yeah. when I get it from Whole Foods. And I, I noticed that I could get away with maybe not hitting. So for example, if, um, if like, let's say 240 is the number. And I got 200 grams of all whole food, and I but I didn't get the other 40 grams. And then the, and then another example, I get 240, but 120 of it came from the protein powder. My body seems to have respond will respond better to a, even a little bit less protein, but coming from whole foods than overloading with the protein, but almost all of it coming yes. from powders now, and bars. Now here's the question. And I can't explain it. Yeah, yes. That's, yeah. Now here's the real question: Is are you better off missing by a big amount? Uh, and not supplementing with protein powder? No. no. I think... That's well, why I use example 200 and 240. Yes. Because if I was... The, if you were like 150... Yes. Yeah. So I... That's 100%. So I think the key with protein powder is this. You have it. And you have it and you use it when you miss your target. That's it. I personally... I used to tell clients, and I still kind of stand by this, is like one shake a day is probably okay. You know? Like one shake, maybe have it when it's most needed and convenient it tends to be post-workout because post-workout people in a hurry and I got to have the shake real quick or whatever. Personally, personally, shakes for me are always best at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I, you know, it's, oh, it's eight o'clock at night. I'm going to go to bed in a couple hours and I don't really feel like eating. So let me see. Oh, let me kind of loosely figure out my protein. Ooh, I'm, I'm off by like 80 grams. Let me throw a 60 gram shake or 50 gram shake in there. That's how I like let's, to use it. And that's how I recommend that's it. That's how I've used it. You will not, supplements still will not replace uh, whole natural foods. So the goal is to get as close as you can with whole natural foods and whatever you miss, then you can use uh, supplemental protein. Powder. There's one last thing I want to address on this question because we don't know. Um, we're assuming this person that's that's trying to hit 240. They're 240 pounds. We're not assuming that. We know that. They tell us that. But where your body fat percentage makes a difference too on how detrimental missing the 240 mark. Yeah, if is. you're two, if you're trying to hit two, if you weigh 240 and you're 25 percent body fat. You you you're, you don't need to hit two forty. Right, you you're o you're okay if you're go short. off of your lean body mass. That's right. Yeah. So if it, but if this person is relatively lean, 
say yeah. they're 5% body fat and they're 240. Well, that's more than relative. That's shredded. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. You know, but, the, you know, there's a big difference, right? I just yes. want to use an extreme analogy. That person, you want to be hitting 240 for sure because yep. otherwise you're not maximizing the full potential of, of building muscle. But if you are, you know, higher body fat percentage and your lean body mass is, say, only around 170, you know, 180, well, then you're okay falling closer to 190. Yeah. Now, the, now, the next question, I know this isn't part of the question, but I'm sure people watching this are going to wonder what's the best protein powder in that case? Which one should I take? It really doesn't matter unless your protein is low. If, if you're eating low, if there's a low amount of protein in your diet, then the protein type makes a bigger difference. Animal proteins are, are better than plant proteins generally. But if your protein intake's high, it really doesn't make that big of a difference. We're really literally splitting hair. So you can get your protein from plant sources, animal sources, whey, eggs. It's all good. As long as it's high, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Next question is from the entity known as Manny. What are your opinions on stretching before and after workouts? You know what? I'm going to talk about the after workout. Okay, so static stretching. So we'll talk about static stretching. That's when you hold a stretch for a long period of time. It's that traditional type of stretching. It's what most, I guess, the average person will think about when you say stretching. Post-workout, especially when you're, your muscle is pumped, there's some evidence. Actually, there's decent amount of evidence that deep stretching induces muscle hypertrophy. Now, the hypertrophy that you get, it's a bit of a short uh, gain, so you'll see this immediate gain and then it kind of plateaus. Nonetheless, I've experimented with this where I'll work a body part and then I'll do a really deep stretch of that same body part at the end of the workout when it's really pumped, and I do notice some beneficial effects. So I'll start with that. I think post-workout stretch, and you don't have to worry about the CNS at that point, you know, making a muscle maybe disengage a little bit. Who cares? You're done with your workout. Mm -hmm. um, static stretching post-workout, especially in the muscle that's been worked and pumped and warm, it's actually kind of cool. It's an advanced technique. Give it a shot. I, yeah. think, I think that stretching in general is fantastic. I just think that it's applied incorrectly. Yeah. Um, you know, we should say, uh, you know, stretch with purpose, right? So if you're going to, don't just stretch to stretch. And I think that, I think stretching has been um, promoted for so long as it's, you know, oh, it's so beneficial. So you should stretch all the time. And I think there was this idea that you should definitely stretch before you go in and work out, and it's been applied incorrectly. When you hold a stretch, and I'm speaking specifically to static stretching, which is the most common way of stretching, which right. mo the average person is is used to seeing. So, if you hold a stretch for 30 seconds and beyond, uh, you know it doesn't matter what it is. You could be stretching anything, and then you go into a, an active workout. Not a good idea. You've basically relaxed those muscles, relaxed that body, and then you're going to go call upon it to do something either explosive or heavy, and that's just not smart, dangerous, not a good idea. Doing something more like mobility that where you're, or an active stretch where they're, they're short holds and you're basically just kind of you know warming the, the muscle up, right? Pumping blood and fluid into there to get it warmed up and prepared or get better connected. That's a great way to start uh, your workouts. And then post, I agree with what you're saying, Sal, incredible to stretch post, incredible to stretch throughout the day, the rest of the day too. Yeah. There's nothing wrong when you're watching TV, get down and, you know, in the pigeon or in a 90-90 and do a nice hold and stretch. I think that's phenomenal for you. But before you go into a workout, uh, you're not wanting to send the signal of the body to relax. You want, you want to be active and alert and ready to go. And when you static stretch before you go into a workout, that's exactly the signal you're the body. Yeah, I mean, would you guys really do a static stretch anymore before a workout? Uh, never, I, never, right? No. It, it, I mean, unless there was like some serious, serious limitation yep. uh, that was was limiting you uh, from even being able to to do these types of movements and and, and get into positions. Uh, but other than that, I mean, you're, you're the, the whole intent. Good point. Of uh, you know, working out, and adding load is to to create tension. Uh, and then I see it more as like uh, in post uh, to then relax the entire system and, and and be in that state. And even if I were to static stretch to like get a muscle to get out of the way so I can do something else, for example. It's like, usually for correctional exercise. I right, say, right. So like, okay, so, but even then I would do something dynamic or active afterwards to kind of, for example, okay, like someone trying to stretch their chest out, right, or warm their chest up before like a bench press, but their shoulders are so tight and pulled forward. Like maybe you would do this static stretch on the anterior delt to kind of relax the shoulders a little bit so you can then do this kind open of... Open you up. Yeah. yeah, open you up so then you can do this kind of dynamic warm-up for the chest, but then I would still do something dynamic to 
to reactivate the shoulder. So I get him to relax. Right. So I can get into a deep stretch on the chest. And he still needs but support. I, so it's yes. not just yeah passive. So I would yeah, I never totally just agree. do a pure static yeah. stretch by I, itself. I think a better example would be I would do this with clients sometimes. There, there was so tight in the front of their body that they couldn't do a proper row because literally yep. it kept their shoulders forward. So then I would do a static stretch of the chest, which would just get it out of the way, and then we could do a better row. And since the chest is not involved in the row, right. it wasn't really that big of a deal. So to, to kind of break this down a little more, here's what happens when you do a, a static stretch. The reason why you improve the flexibility in that short term, when you hold a stretch, you're, by the way, your muscles don't get any longer, and they don't become more pliable like if you warm rubber up or something like that. That's not what happens. What happens is you're sending a, a signal to the, the master of muscle contractions, which is your central nervous system. And the signal is saying, hey, it's cool. You can relax a little, a little bit. Stop keeping this muscle so tight. That's why when you hold a stretch, you find like, oh my God, I can go move a little forward. Oh, I got a little bit more range of motion. Because the CNS is literally starting to relax. One more part of that, okay? And this is actually, this came to me today because I was taking Doug through some stretches this morning while he was working out. If your goal is to do a static stretch, to increase range, you know that that range of motion. Let's say at the end of a workout, you have to relax and breathe through the stretch because if you keep mm -hmm. your face tense and tight and you're trying to hold, you're sending a conflicting signal to the central nervous system. You're saying relax the muscle, but my, wait a minute, the rest of me is saying keep everything tight because I'm in a lot of pain. Yeah. So and I learned this in yoga. I remember doing a yin yoga class. You got to breathe through it. Yeah, and and I was like tensing, and the lady comes over and she goes, "Start breathe, relax." She's like, "Your body's not going to loosen up if you're." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, it makes perfect sense." So I just kind of sat in it and opened up a little bit and it, it totally worked. But yeah, pre-workout, dynamic stretching, mobility work, priming, post-workout, static stretching. And I think that's kind of the yeah, winning- maybe the foam rolling. The winning formula. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness or health goal. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsalen. Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam. 